Please welcome to the podium from the United Nations Environment Program, Jacqueline Alder. Uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our next panel. We have Richard Thompson of Plymouth University on my right here, Elizabeth Taylor Jay from Columbia's Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, Andreas Merkel of the Ocean Conservancy, Daniela Russo of the Think Beyond Plastics Innovation Forum, and Brian Flaherty from Nestle Waters North America. Like the previous panel this morning, our panelists will be presenting the science, the problems, and solutions surrounding the issue of marine debris. We will hear about the impacts of marine debris, particularly plastics, on the marine environment. We will also hear about some of the innovative approaches that are underway to address marine debris and proposals for new solutions to meet this challenge. Let's begin with the state of science. Our first presenter, Dr. Richard Thompson, Professor of Marine Biology at Plymouth University in the United Kingdom, who has spent much of the last decade studying marine debris. Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. From a distance, it's very clear that ours is a blue planet. But as we move closer, we see very quickly that the surface of our oceans and our seas is strewn with marine debris. Debris of all shapes, sizes, and colors. It's widely distributed at the sea surface. It's also present on our shorelines in substantial accumulations worldwide. Here, we see a beach in Hawaii. It even penetrates our deepest oceans, thousands of meters below the sea surface. Here, we see plastic bottles on the seabed of the Mediterranean. Some of this debris is so large, we can see it from space by satellite. But actually, the most abundant items, the microplastics, some are so small that we need the aid of a microscope to resolve them. If we look at the types of debris by material, it becomes very clear from most surveys that the majority of that debris, typically around 75%, is plastic. This debris is distributed widely by wind and by tide and can accumulate in places far from the nearest landfall, as we see here in this slide of the Atlantic, where some of the greatest accumulations are thousands of miles away from land. Marine debris is harmful. It is damaging to our economies, affecting tourism and reducing the catches of fisheries. The costs of cleanup and of measures to reduce marine debris are substantial, estimated at half a billion on the west coast of the USA alone. Marine debris also presents a hazard to mariners, resulting in thousands of call-outs and rescues by the Coast Guard agencies every year. Perhaps most documented are the challenges that marine debris presents to wildlife. Over 76% of all encounters between wildlife and marine debris are with plastic debris, affecting some 700 species worldwide. Around about 10% of those species already threatened or endangered from a variety of causes. We look at some specific examples. Seabirds, for example, widely, widely affected through entanglement and ingestion of debris. And for the few species where we have very good population level, we find that the incidence is really quite widespread. Here we see the northern fulmar in European waters. Survey data shows that over 95% of some populations of northern fulmar contain plastic debris in their guts. They're contaminated with unnecessary plastic items. The problem also applies to commercial fisheries, the catches of fish and shellfish contaminated by microplastic debris. Items so small, not terribly abundant, but small and present in up to 80% of some populations, the hazards of which we are yet to fully unravel. If we look at the sources of this debris, then we find, although the relative proportions vary between locations and between surveys, Typically, 
Packaging, single-use items account for around about 50% of the debris that's recorded in surveys by Marine Conservation Society, Ocean Conservancy worldwide. So then what do we do about this problem? There's one thing that I want to point out at this stage, that there's something fundamentally different about the problem of marine debris that is different from some of the other challenges that face our oceans today. In that the items that become marine debris, they bring society benefits. The packaging you see at the top of this slide has brought us benefits in terms of food security. But those benefits can be realized without the need for any emission of debris to the environment. Those benefits can be realized without the need to exploit non-renewable marine resources. So in that sense, the items that become marine debris do so entirely unnecessarily. This is an avoidable problem. We can have the benefits of the items that eventually become marine debris without needing to have the debris. So then what do we do? At the bottom of this slide, you see the notion of a cleanup, perhaps a technological fix to the problem. Well, cleanup is very worthwhile. The cleanup was not going to make any sense in isolation. It's rather like trying to mop up the bathroom floor while the bath is overflowing and the taps are turned on full. Cleanup will only really work if we can take measures further up the chain to reduce. We can try to plug all of the holes, but those are many and diverse, and there's a danger that we could merely end up diverting the problem elsewhere. At the top of the picture, we see those items of plastic debris that we highlighted, packaging debris. The key solution in the long term, although we have to recognize there's no single silver bullet here, it's a question of combining these measures, but in the long term, the key solution has to be to divert that debris away from the oceans. And an effective way of achieving that is to ensure that the items that we produce are designed so they can be effectively and easily captured via recycling. Not only will this help to reduce the flow of debris to the oceans, it will also help us to capture resource that would otherwise be lost to the environment, lost to the oceans, to capture that valuable resource. So in the long term, it's about making sure we achieve synergy between resource efficiency and our desire to reduce marine debris. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now for the problems. We will now hear from Elizabeth Taylor Jay, who serves as the Director of Marine, Coastal, and Aquatic Affairs for Columbia's Ministry of the Environment and has over 20 years of experience in the field of marine and coastal management and conservation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me begin by telling you a little about my country. Colombia is one of the world's mega diverse countries with ecosystems from the high Andes mountains to deep oceans. Our coastal and marine ecosystems are typical for the tropics with mangroves, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. Colombia is in the northwest corner of South America and borders with the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic at the Caribbean Sea. This location is critical for biodiversity hotspot and also for ocean health. Today, the country's marine ecosystems are facing many problems, and pollution is one of the most pressing. It is important to note that most of this pollution is land-based. Colombia is a very mountainous country with complex watersheds, and there are tight linkages between the land and the sea. One of the greatest sources of pollution to the Caribbean is the Magdalen Cauca River Basin. This basin covers nearly 100,000 square miles, an area about the size of the US state of Wyoming. It includes 726 municipalities, of which 128 are laid directly on the banks of the Magdalene River. More than 38 million people live in the basin. This is about 80% of the country's population. This area generates 
85% of Colombia GDP. We have known for years that there are problems here of pollution. UNEP identified major pollution problems that are aggravated by poverty, inequality, conflict, and lack of funding for environmental institutions. But information wasn't available to help us solve this situation. Nowadays, this is changing. As a result of studies done by INBEMAR, our National Marine Institute, and the recent Caribbean Water Quality Report produces as, as part of the Global Partnership for Oceans, GPO, with support from the World Bank, at last we have information on water quality, pollution sources, and impacts to the marine environment. For example, in regard to plastic litter, an analysis was done by the Ocean Recovery Alliance as part of the GPO. This study found that between 69 and 91 percent of the thousands of tons of plastic waste generated every year in the Magdalen Cauca River basin ends up in the Caribbean Sea. This is of great concern. Many efforts are going on on at municipal levels to address plastic waste management, but these are only minimally solving the problem of marine pollution. This study also revealed that of the estimated total plastic waste, 62% or more could come from rural populations that are not served by municipal government. Ocean Recovery Alliance analyzed the impact of per capita generation of plastic waste and found potentials for a 37% decrease of plastic litter in the Caribbean if rural per capita generation could be reduced by half. So now we know that we can make a real change by concentrating efforts in rural areas, not only on cities. Nowadays, the Colombian government is fully engaged in looking how to reduce land-based pollution to improve marine and coastal ecosystem health. We are tackling an holistic sustainable development approach, tackling this problem from all sides by developing regulations, environmental quality standards, and best management practices. To succeed at improving ocean health and water quality efforts must be linked to effective financing mechanisms to ensure appropriate timely actions. Government can't simply build infrastructure to treat waste or solid waste and also have to implement new regulatory frameworks. The ocean is a common goal for all nations and together we are facing the challenges of pollution. We can't solve these problems alone, so we must continue to work together very hard collaboratively on global initiatives and promote stronger international decisions that will help us protect the future of the oceans that ultimately will decide the future of humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now for the solutions. We have three speakers, starting with Andreas Merkel, the CEO of the Ocean Conservancy, where he leads efforts to turn good science into good ocean policy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, ocean Conservancy, we have been doing this thing called International Coastal Cleanup for the last 30 years. And we've collected 173 million pounds of trash. And I wish I could tell you that uh, there is a declining tendency, um, but there is not. Um, it just keeps going. The avalanche keeps going. Um, so I should be a very sad person, um, but I'm not. I'm actually full of hope. I think there's a solution to all of that. And I'm going to get there in a moment, but I want to sort of state some very basic um, facts first. Um, first of all, there is a lot of really good discussion going on about what I would call the systemic solutions to this problem. Things like the circular economy, rethink, redesign, reuse, regenerative consumption. Um, and these are absolutely the right things to talk about and to do. And over the next 20 or 30 years, these are going to solve the problem. I'm quite sure of it. 
But in the next 10 or 20 years, they are not going to solve the problem. And what's going to happen if we just keep going and wait for good things to happen in the future is we're going to double the amount of plastic that's currently in the ocean in the next 10, 20 years. That's about 300 to 350 million tons of plastic in the ocean. That comes out to about one ton of plastic for every two tons of fish, maybe three tons of fish. We're not exactly sure how many fish there are. But think about that for a minute. Right? And that plastic, as we saw earlier, it gets broken down into little pieces. And these little pieces actually soak up. They have this absorptive quality where they soak up the background toxicity, the industrial nasties that are in the water. And they magnify them. And we also know that it does get eaten by seabirds, by fish. And we surmise that it does great harm there. So I'm not sure about you, but for me, it is just unthinkable that we would add 300, that we would have in 10 or 20 years 300 uh, million tons in the water of toxic plastics. So what to do about it? I think we need to, as I said earlier, we need to get also a solution that's at the end of the pipe. The end of the pipe is basically consumers discarding consumables. It's quite simple. And most of these consumers don't do so because they're careless. They do so because they don't have any alternative. They live in industrializing countries where the consumption of plastic is like this. It's going up explosively. But the installation of, of infrastructure is about like this. And you have this enormous gap. And there is no collection. And there's no transport. And there are no bins. The technology to fix this is quite simple, right? It's transport and collection technology, not hard at all. The tough part is how do you install and maintain that technology at scale in a locally appropriate way in an entire country? But just so happened that there's a problem that's totally analogous to that, right? And that's the access to, to clean water problem, which is being done perfectly, beautifully. For example, in South Africa, PepsiCo, Nestle, Coca-Cola, and other consumer products companies are partnering with the government to install locally appropriate filtration systems in villages and towns. And the incidence of waterborne diseases is going down very steeply. Right? So the industry that, has, that knows how to do it is partnering up. Waste management is exactly the same thing. Right? A simple technology, trucks, dumps, bins, and so on, installed by the people who know how to do it, which are basically consumer products companies who make the stuff to begin with, and they have that power over the last mile. Right? They have the logistics. They have the distribution system. They certainly have the financing. Right? Them partnering up with the government to do this locally appropriate, whole country, one country at a time, and solve this problem. Right? In the short term, it's the solution for everything else. If we don't collect the stuff and concentrate it somewhere and keep it down from the ocean, what will happen is not good for anybody. Solving it is good for everybody. It's good for the countries because it's a public health issue now. It's a flooding issue. It's certainly good for the ocean. It's essential for the ocean that this is being done. Right? It's good for the companies who install in it and who, who invest in it because they are, rather than have their brand associated with, 300 million, with an avalanche of toxic plastic, they become basically heroes. Um, and um, we, you know, it's got to happen. Um, I think this is a very, very promising approach. And at Ocean Conservancy, we're deeply committed to working with the, the most innovative, forward-looking uh, companies that really want to engage in what we think really is an essential issue to ocean health. So you cannot have a healthy ocean with this going on. Um, we want to engage with them. I invite all of you to, to join us in this and to talk to me afterwards. There's a lot of specifics to this. Before I leave the stage, I um, also want to thank the State Department for being such a great partner of ours um, in the International Coastal Cleanup. And I want to ask all of you um, to join us September 20th. I will see you on the world's beaches uh, for our next um, cleanup. Thank you very much. Our next solution panelist is Daniela Russo of the Think Beyond Plastics Innovation Forum, where, as CEO, she continues her longtime work to elevate plastic pollution to the forefront of global, social, environmental, and political discourse. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all who decided to stay here and listen to us talk about trash. 
This is a difficult conversation to have, but a really important one. And I really wanted to thank Secretary Kerry, not just for organizing this conference and for having the vision to raise these important issues, but to encourage us to think big and be bold and audacious. Because when it comes to plastic pollution, some creative disruption is in order. You already heard that the majority of marine debris is comprised of plastic. When you look into the statistics, it's very easy to understand why. In the last 20 years, we've used and consumed more plastic than the entire 20th century. Just think about this and look at this graph for a minute. From about 2 million tons in the 50s to 260 million tons in 2010. This is all plastic that is still here with us on this planet with no place to go. Why do we use so much plastic? Well, because it's great. Plastic is a material that's essentially very versatile. You can do anything out of plastic, and we know that. It's used today in almost every aspect of life. Many of you here have plastic lids on your cups, plastic liners on these cups. It's impossible to get away from plastic, but the essential qualities that plastic products have are also inherent design flaws. Plastic is very lightweight, which makes products extremely easy to litter. Plastic production uses toxic compounds that have known long-term effects on people and animals, effects on the endocrine system. We know about this. And above and beyond that, plastic lasts forever. Whether it's 300 or 400 or 500 years sort of doesn't matter. None of us will live enough to see it. Yet increasingly, we make single-use and disposable products out of this, products intended specifically to be thrown away. There is a big problem with plastic products as well. They have no end of life plan. When you look into that chart that Andreas was hand waving when he was talking about, this is the production of plastic and our ability to recover it from data of the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. The picture is not very different around the world. There are countries with no collection infrastructure whatsoever, as my colleague from Colombia was talking about. There are countries that have Im implemented bold and kind of more forward-thinking policies where collection have got, has gone up. But above all, plastic, our ability to collect plastic lags severely behind our consumption rates. So what's being done about that? Well, the problem has become so visible that hundreds of environmental organizations around the world are raising awareness about this. They're telling people not to use plastic, not to use disposable plastic. But that's not a good enough answer. We know that if you tell businesses to replace plastic with something else today, they will ask us, with what? Plastic is used in construction, it's used in agriculture, it's used in transportation. Plastic is used in almost every aspect of life. So when everybody tells us it's not possible, we need to lean on the three important ingredients. Innovation, which helps us reimagine new products and new materials, new infrastructures, we need to lean on the entrepreneurs who bring this innovation to the market, to market and commercialize it. And we lead, need to lean on investment in infrastructure and in this innovation and entrepreneurship. So I am here to tell you that plastic is a great business opportunity. This is an industry that's about $400 billion today, and almost half of it is big orange bubbles there. This is packaging. This is that single-use and disposable plastic we were talking about with construction and agriculture. There is a terrific business opportunity ready for, for disruption, ready for innovation. What is important for us to think about is what do we do with it? And so I'm here to announce the Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Forum. Think Beyond Plastic encourages to think beyond conventional plastics. The Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Forum has as its heart focus on entrepreneurship and innovation for sustainable solutions to the plastic pollution crisis. The Think Beyond Plastic Innovation Forum has a business accelerator that identifies entrepreneurs around the world who work on alternatives to plastic. It invests in them through the Think Beyond Plastic Investment Fund, and it helps them create and commercialize these technologies and products. And let me tell you what we already have at the Accelerator. Today, innovation at the Accelerator is able to produce clay filters in the, from the soil in Guatemala. So people have clean drinking water instead of water that comes in plastic bottles for which this country has no infrastructure for recycling. 
Today, at the accelerator, we're able to produce out of paper pulp with clay nanoparticles, an alternative to the conventional plastic material that is used for these ubiquitous coffee pods and coffee lids. They're, they're, this is a paper product, and it's a product that has similar qualities to the ones of plastic. Today, at the accelerator, we have the capacity to produce plastic bottles that do not leach endocrine activity. Today, at the accelerator, we can make medical instruments made of paper pulp. These are all companies that are commercializing patented technology. And today, at the accelerator, we have a great alternative to the utensils that were also on Andreas's slide, which is one of the top items of plastic pollution on the beaches. So the innovators are innovating. The entrepreneurs are working on commercializing these technologies. We're here because there are opportunities ahead of us that are inherent to the success of a future without plastic pollution. Thank you. And our final solution panelist is Brian Flaherty, Vice President of Public Policy and External Affairs at Nestle Waters North America, where he develops and implements corporate, government affairs, sustainability, and stakeholder engage engagement strategies. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to join you today, and good afternoon. We've heard from our previous speakers some of the problems of marine debris in our oceans, how plastic makes up most of marine debris, and how we need to stop them from entering our oceans in the first place, and some of the promise for innovation that lies just ahead of us. What I'd like to do is take you on a bit of a journey, <clears throat> a journey my company, Nestle Waters, began years ago, and that we're still on, to achieve zero waste, and along the way share a couple of the lessons that we've learned. My company, Nestle Waters North America, is the largest water bottler in North America. And our ultimate vision is that none of our bottles are littered and end up on the side of the road. None of our bottles end up in the oceans. And we are setting our sights on zero waste. And incidentally, none of them in landfills. When I started at my company 11 years ago, I was told that our, we viewed our stewardship responsibility as source to shelf. Now with the help of retailers, recyclers, NGOs, other bottlers, and pretty much anybody who'll talk to us, we're looking to extend our reach beyond the shelf in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle fashion so that our packaging finds new life and feedstock for new materials. And that maybe the slides advance. Since our company's founding, um, we have, we've been on a journey since 1976 that has led us really was guided by the, when we mapped our carbon footprint. And I'm happy to say that in that journey of building LEED certified factories, the first food and beverage company to design a factory for LEED certification, where we stand today is that our factories have, we have nine LEED certified factories. We have a 97% average waste diversion, and that six of our factories are in fact zero waste. You see, we've learned that one of the greatest impacts that a beverage manufacturer can have on our environmental footprint is the design of our containers. And then through two things, policy and action, to see that those containers are recaptured and recycled when they're empty. So several years ago, with a lighter footprint, in, environmental footprint in mind, we started lightweighting and reducing the weight of our packages. The industry took notice, consumers took notice. Today, I'm happy to say that three of our brands are available in 50% recycled content fiber. And so that means that the old saying that the glass is half full, we like to say that those brands of our bottles are half full of recycled content. And that helps raise the question, why not more? Why not 100%? Recycling is the cornerstone of sustainable packaging. So let's talk policy for a minute. Because for decades, the beverage industry has tried with mixed success to grapple with the issues around our, our packaging. In the United States today, 38.6 of water bottles are recycling. That is a low rate. And while it is growing, it isn't fast enough. If we could put it down to this and sum up what I'm trying to say in one sentence is, we put water in bottles 
and we don't think that bottles should be put in the water. So six years ago, our company set a goal to achieve a 60% recycling rate within 10 years. That was 2008. Our goal is to 2018. And it doesn't mean we're going to be happy with six out of every 10 bottles, but it's a start. And so we looked around for the policies. In the United States, 10 states have deposit programs. Um, 40 states don't have comprehensive recycling policies. So we looked to Canada, Nestle Waters North America. We looked to EPR, producer responsibility. Andreas talked about, cons we talked about cons uh, Consuming can be a powerful figure. The markets can be very powerful agents of change. And so we look to what's happening in the province of Manitoba, which has achieved 61% recycling. We look to Europe. We looked and have teamed in the US with Recycling Reinvented to talk about market-driven recycling solutions, not just for beverage containers, but that all the plastic, when you go home tonight, open your refrigerator and look at the opportunities we have. But policy takes time. Policy takes time, and so with action, I'm happy to announce today that you could look at our world's ocean is vast. We're starting with the Hillsborough River watershed in Florida. And what we're going to do is we're partnering with Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful and Tampa Bay Watch to do a watershed to create and begin the process of a trash-free waterway. It may be small, it may be humble, but it's in the ground near where our sources are. It is a very strong place for us to start. And to any of the folks in the room, today is about recognizing the issue and our role within it. And I would share with you, as you look at your role, don't be afraid to ask hard questions of yourself. Be humble, challenge yourself, be transparent about your journey to get there. Listen, learn, and adapt. But whatever you do, move forward. And I thank you very much. Let's go to I'd like to thank our panelists for their very thought-provoking presentations. We will be opening up the floor to all of you and to our online audience. If you wish to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand and someone will come with a microphone. For those of you online, please post your questions via Twitter using the hashtag OurOceans2014. However, before we get to questions, though, I'd like to call upon Robert Benson of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, who would like to make an announcement about a new initiative that, her, that his agency is leading to help protect our oceans. Robert, over to you. Great. No, no, it's coming. My name is Bob Benson. I manage the Marine Pollution Control Branch at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The clear message from our panelists today is that the best way to eliminate trash and debris from the ocean is to keep trash from entering the water in the first place. In recognition of this reality, EPA has shifted the focus of its long-standing marine debris program to the prevention of trash and litter on land and at the water's edge. We have created a new program called Trash Free Waters that will be a catalyst for more effective actions by state and local governments, businesses, and the general public to keep U.S. water bodies and coastal areas trash free and thereby keep trash and debris out of the ocean. Trash Free Waters aims to encourage sustainable product design, increase material recovery and reuse, and create a trash prevention ethic in all parts of society. We will work closely with many government agencies and private sector stakeholders across the country. I'd like to talk with the gentleman from Nestle during the next break to help individual states, cities, and communities figure out the best strategies to achieve their trash prevention and material recovery goals. We are assessing the costs of trash to U.S. society. We are researching the health and ecological risks from trash. We are exploring ways to fundamentally change citizen behaviors when it comes to dealing with their own trash. We look forward to building a program that will prompt practical yet innovative actions at all levels of society to ensure that U.S. waters become trash free. As we make progress with this prevention oriented model, 
We hope that trash-free waters can serve as a model for others around the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, before we get to the questions, though, um, as moderator, I'd like to take uh, the opportunity um, to mention the United Nations Environment Program um, partnerships that we have under our uh, GPA, Global Program for the Prevention of, La of, uh, Prevention of the Environment from Land-Based Activities. We have three partnerships, one on nutrient management, which is one of the topics after this panel, the marine litter, and the Global Wastewater Initiative these include platforms for sharing information, especially on the solutions to problems of marine litter and nutrient uh, pollution. And I encourage you to contact me after the pa panel, and I can give you details on, on those partnerships if you'd like to join. And uh, now I'd like to open the floor and our uh, lines to our online audience to offer comments or pose questions. So let's begin. Oh, okay, gentleman over there. Uh. Hi there. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Thompson for uh, briefly featuring uh, my work there. Uh, I am that, uh, the 19-year-old who uh, developed a method to um, uh, get plastic from the Great Pacific uh, Garbage Patch. And uh, now, uh, last week, actually, we have uh, published our report, uh, 528 uh, pages confirming it's indeed uh, a feasible method to clean half the plastic uh, from the Pacific Garbage Patch in just uh, 10 years. Uh, but I'd also like to thank Mr. Thompson for um, stressing that, indeed, it would be uh, like uh, mopping the floor when the tap is still running. Uh, however, now we have finally been able to confirm that there at least is a uh, mop to, once the tap is closed, uh, clean it up. So, uh, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any other comments or questions? It's really hard to see. <laughs> oh, lady over there. Um, Wendy Benchley uh, from Wild Aid and, and other groups. I'm interested to know, um, especially interested to know whether uh, you, Andres, uh, whether you're working with um, the bottlers around the world to get this going, to get them to be responsible the what the bottle? for, oh. you know, to get them to be responsible for their own recycling. I mean, I think that that is where the solution is to make it the responsibility of the manufacturers and the marketers to take care of their own trash. And um, so I'm curious to know whether there is a coalition of businesses and um, whether, whether the bottlers, um, whether you're working with other businesses to, to get them on board with, with, with the very good work that you're doing. Um, Both of you, sorry. First of all, it's, um, thanks for that good question, Wendy. Um, first of all, it's broader than the, the, the bottlers, right? It's all of the consumer products that involve plastics, whether that is a can of motor oil or whether that is a water bottle, right? The, the problem is much bigger than just, than just bottlers. Um, there are various ways in which we are working on this. One of them is there is a Trash Free Seas Coalition um, where actually NGOs, academics, um, and uh, um, corporate entities are working together to try to figure out a way into this problem. Um, and um, that's probably the, the only um, forum there is where this is being sort of collaboratively performed. Um, we are um, just embarking now on a global effort to really engage um, with these companies on this sort of approach that I outlined um, in my talk. Yes, right. Wendy, we're, we're uh, working with anybody who will help us be a better company. And part of that involves working with the people on this stage and some discussions we had leading up to our, to our panel. Um, it, you know, in the United States, 70% of what Americans drink comes in a can, a bottle, or a box. And that's quite a bit of, of containers to pick up. 
And, there are, and, and we're in a developed nation, and we should have the systems there. So we're working with other companies, as, as we've supported, to put the cost of reclaiming and recycling our, prod, our products into the price of that product. And then working to get the best in technology in terms of recyclers like Carbon Light, which turns bottles into bottles in California and about to do it in Texas, and other folks all the way through the value chain from the beginning of supply all the way up to the point that hopefully our containers become ready to be recycled and turned into something else. Okay, I believe the gentleman there had a question. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lauren Wiener. I'm from All One Ocean. Thank you for inviting me here today. I wanted to invite a conversation with um, the Trash Free Waters folks and um, anybody else who's interested in our simple, scalable, inexpensive solution of a beach cleanup station, essentially a wooden box that gets mounted at the entrance to beaches and allows anybody to clean up the beach anytime they approach it. Um, it has a community aspect as well. It's a wonderful solution. I'd love to speak with anybody who's interested. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, the young man at the front here. Hi, I'm Carter with One More Generation. Um, I started a nonprofit a while ago, and we learned about the issues of plastic pollution when we were helping out in the Gulf with the oil spill. And we teach kids now about the issue of plastic pollution and we go into schools, but we don't know how to get into schools nationwide on how we could teach the young kids so that they can make a difference. Um, are there any suggestions on how you, you could help um, us get into more schools? Carter, I will answer your question. First of all, congratulations to you and your sister, Olivia. Is that you, Olivia? For the excellent work you're doing. You are my inspiration when we think about the future generation. You two and Boyan Slat there in the back because we need innovators, we need people like you to lead the way. Uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition has an organization called Plastic Free Campuses and that has 150 campuses throughout the world that educate on plastic pollution. You too need to be a part of this and you need to represent the youngest part of these campuses, the middle schools, the elementary schools and people who go into high school. So again, thank you for your great work. Carter, uh, there is no better force to change habits than what you're working on right now in the next generation. In the US, we work with Keep America Beautiful to launch Recycle Bowl. And I've been going to middle schools to go see some of the innovative ways that they're recycling. It's about changing behavior. Uh, and up in Manitoba, the province of Manitoba in Canada, I can get you some information. They have a Recycle Everywhere program that has a Recycle Everywhere 101, which is in 75% of the schools in the province of Manitoba. There must be some secret to the way they got in there. And I'd be happy to, to, to be a gateway to get you that information. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And this gentleman here has been patiently waiting. Yeah. I'm Roberto Cavalcanti from the Secretary of Biodiversity, Brazilian Ministry of the Environment. And I'd like to congratulate the panelists on the excellent presentations and say that from a government framework, mm -hmm. one of the paradoxes we have is that you presented a global issue, but in almost every country, management of and recycling is a municipal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in Brazil, 20% of the world's fresh water that flows through rivers into the ocean comes from Brazil, obviously. Major contribution from the Amazon, but that highlights the fact that a lot of these problems are generated thousands of kilometers from the sea through the rivers. And uh, although coastal communities are obviously have a huge role, in practice, for instance, in Rio de Janeiro Bay, when they started the pollution control, they realized that what they had to do was put physical barriers in the rivers that go into the bay. That's where the issues are. And you can't do that with the Amazon River or the Paraguay River or the Plata River. So I sort of <clears throat> turn back the questions to the panel is understanding how the legislation works and the, the fact that municipalities are responsible for the issues in most countries. How would you envision solving an ocean can, program can or problem, you can uh, that. considering that the terrestrial environments are the major contributors yeah. to the, the issue that you've raised. Well, 
you're absolutely right that it is a global problem and it doesn't just affect coastal communities. And rivers are a really important input of that debris to the ocean. And we're only really now beginning to recognize that. And I think it's really important that through our education programs, we make it apparent that this is a problem that affects all nations and it affects people living on the coast and it affects those that are far inland. So we need that message to get through that it's not just a problem for the coasts. You're absolutely right as well that we've talked in a very broad brush way about global solutions. I think the answers are that we need to think about the applications and the use of the things that become marine debris on a more regional scale. It could be in some nations where there's developed infrastructure to collect things for recycling, that that's perhaps the best route. But in an economy that's perhaps more emerging that doesn't have that infrastructure, maybe it's designing products so that reuse can come higher in the hierarchy. So we need to think about the products we design on a more of a regional basis to make sure that we don't end up producing as, as much waste because it's that um, recognition of things as having low, no value that results in the human behavior of us discarding them. So we need to add value back to those items that are becoming waste and that will take a regional approach. Okay, Elizabeth? Yes, um, definitely what the, um like an important approach is to, is to combine sound regulations, uh, but at the same time um, using um, better consumption um, like practices, and at the same time also working on recycling and incorporating a lot of awareness um, within the schools and within also the general public. In Colombia, for example, we have, we have been uh, fully engaged uh, in, in, in make the general public to understand uh, about the downstream, eff downstream effect because many people that live, for example, in these large cities, Bogota or uh, Neiba or all these cities that are, are along the Magdalene River um, basin, uh, they didn't realize that a lot of the activities that they do at uh, this central part of the um, country are affecting the sea. So we are going through a lot of awareness program and through the um, Global Partnership for the Oceans and Ocean Recovery Alliance, uh, we are uh, testing um, a global alert, the Global Alert Platform, which is a, um, a platform to map um, like hotspots of solid waste along the river stream and that will help us also to, to tackle um, these problems at, at the site. So it, it's very important um, to combine all these, um, all these solutions and initiatives because uh, um, recycling by its own is not going to solve the problem. Uh, regulation by, by its own is not going to do it also. It's, so it's, it's a package of solutions. Um, we've got a Twitter feed from uh, Elizabeth Hogan, and she's asked the question, which is an interesting one. How can the seafood industry participate by being more accountable for lost and discarded plastic uh, fishing lines and nets? Sort of taking us into a different uh, area of marine debris would, okay? That we have actually looked at that. And if you look at the different kinds of marine debris that there are in the ocean, you look at what's the most lethal kind, right? What does the most damage? As much damage as the consumer goods do, the single most lethal form of debris in the ocean are obviously those things that were designed to kill to begin with. Right? It's the ghost nets and the drift nets and, um, and so on. Um, and that calls for a very different set of strategies uh, than consumer goods. And it, I think it's probably a technology uh, challenge of saying, how do we not lose these nets? Okay. There is at the Marine Mammal Center in California, um, just north of San Francisco, there is a scarecrow that they've built out of the contents of one, I think, was a sperm whale. It's 200 pounds of net. And it's not one net, it's 40 different kinds of nets, right? So this whale went through the ocean and actually ate 40 different kinds of net that then came into, into, into 200 pounds. That can't happen anymore, right? And we need to figure, basically, it's a, that, that is a massive design challenge that I think we need to tackle. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe another question from the audience. Uh, Carol? Uh, lady in the front row, in the row here. <coughs> Hi, uh, Carol Turley from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I'd like to ask uh, Richard Thompson uh, whether there's been consideration of very small plastics. We've heard about the 
big visible ones, and most of the life in the ocean is microscopic, so I'm wondering what the impact on the lower part of the food chain, and in a sense, the key part of the food chain that supports the, the big things we love and, uh, and see. Thank you. Well, I presented only briefly the fact that, you know, all of the plastic that's in our oceans is fragmenting into smaller and smaller pieces. Some of those pieces too small to be seen to the naked eye. Those are the most abundant items. We're yet to really fully understand the environmental consequences of those items. We've heard discussion today about the potential and the concern about them maybe transporting or releasing chemicals. It's clear that a wide range of organisms will ingest that debris because it's so small, it's available to a much wider suite of organisms. But we're still trying to fully understand what the environmental consequences might be. I think what is apparent is that the way that that very small debris might manifest itself into problems could be quite different. There could be some surprises there compared to the more everyday pictures we see perhaps of a seal entangled or a seabird or a turtle ingesting. So I think there could be some surprises there, but it's an area of science that desperately needs further research to really clarify some of the concerns. Uh, just to add to Richard's statement, there is a report coming out probably in November that UNEP has been a part of that's going to look at this issue of uh, the science around uh, microplastics. Uh, there was one question there for the gentleman. Yeah, yeah I'm Rashid Sumaila from the Fisher ah, Centre, uh, the University of British Columbia. Uh, my intervention is just to try to help us think more globally, right, because we have three key sections. We talked about fisheries early in the morning. We are now talking about marine debris, and later we'll talk about ocean acidification. And I think all these problems are connected, and they are very similar. If you remember one of the slides that was put up about fishing effort in the morning, it was just zooming up, right? You remember that? And when I saw your slide on plastic in the ocean, zooming up, right. tomorrow you're going to see that ocean acidification zooming up. It's, it's the same thing. And everywhere you look, you see these patterns. And why is this the case? It's because the industry and we consumers benefit from, from this kind of thing. We get cheap stuff, and so you have to really get down to the root of this. What are we doing? The cost and the benefit and their distribution are very different, and we need to nail that. For example, fisheries, you see that we're giving subsidies to the fishing sector when there's already overcapacity, right? That is crazy, <laughs> if, you, if you ask me. What, what we need to give them is negative subsidies, actually, not subsidies. And if you think of solutions, if we were to move those subsidies from fisheries to help people clean the ocean, that would be a good thing. So, so the solutions are also intersectoral. We have to think across the board. And this will apply to climate change. There was a point earlier about thinking of ocean services by Sylvia L. I think that is a very good point, because at the moment, most of our departments of fisheries are actually there to help determine how much fish we can catch each year. They don't think globally. They don't think of all these services. We just released a report uh, last on June the 5th where we look at 15 different ocean services that we, from the high seas that we benefit from. And climate, uh, uh, carbon sequestration and fisheries, we compare them. And the benefits, according to the latest numbers, from carbon sequestration of the high seas, it's an order of magnitude, 10 times the value of fish we take from the ocean, and it's good to know this, right? So please, let's think across sectors. Let's see solutions from one problem. We can solve another problem somewhere. Let's think globally and system-wise. Thank you. Okay. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the, the time wardens have uh, closed the questions, but um, hopefully uh, during the break we can... Uh, catch up with our speakers and, and follow up on some of the other questions that weren't asked. And um, I'd like to thank all of you for your questions and thoughts. During the discussion, we heard the various sides of marine debris, as well as in the comments and questions. We looked at the science, the consequences, and more importantly, the solutions all of us can take to start to address this all-pervasive problem. The reason why we should be concerned about marine debris are clear. It affects all of us, from human health, the economy, to wildlife. It is one problem that shows, our, that shows the clear link between what we do on land and what happens in our oceans and coasts. We heard the challenges posed by marine debris, debris pollution from policymakers and how critical it is to have good information to inform decision making and actions to solve these challenges. 
we heard that it's not too late to solve this problem. In the short term, we need to stop marine debris, particularly plastics, from reaching the ocean. And in the long term, we need to innovate and support innovation to either manage materials that contribute to waste and or to manage our waste better. We need to also change our behaviors related, related to consumption and production, as well as waste management. We also heard that there are opportunities for private-public partnerships, and there are a variety of market-based approaches that could help to prevent waste from entering the environment, especially the marine environment. One of the goals of this conference is to consider how to answer Secretary Kerry's call to action to protect the ocean. Keeping in mind the presentations we heard, what actions must we take to, to make an, an immediate a impact? And what actions must we take to set long-term solutions in motion? We heard examples of what governments, civil society, and the private sector are doing. Clearly, there is a role for everyone to help solve this problem, including you. And today's panelists have provided some thought-provoking ideas on where we can all start. However, we're not done discussing marine pollution today. When we return from our break, we are going to hear about another form of marine pollution, nutrient pollution, and what we can do to address that problem. With that, I look forward to seeing you all again after the break, and please contribute to tweet. Please continue to tweet on hashtag oceans, our oceans 2014, and we'll see you hopefully very soon for the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue with the conference after a 15-minute break.